This episode of Long Night with Vish Khanna is brought to you by Pizza Trocadero, The Bookshelf, Planet Bean Coffee, CFRU 93.3 FM, and Granddad's Donuts, and was recorded before a studio audience on Friday, November 22nd, 2019. Coming to you live from the Transact in Toronto, Canada, it's Long Night with Vish Khanna! Authors Alika Reed Benta is here. We have comedians Michael Molasso and James Hartness. Musician and Oscar nominee Owen Fallon is in the house. My name is James Keats. The house band is the Bicycles. And please welcome to the stage a man who is about to really embrace a long winter. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the season premiere of Long Night. How you feeling out there? You doing all right? Nice. Nice to see you. I'm your host, Vish, as uh, James just said. How about a cheer for my sidekick, James Keast? Also, uh, one of the finest bands to ever grace the Transact stage, The Bicycles, our house band. They're the best. Okay, we're going to kick off the show right now. My first guest is the author of this book. It's called Frying Plantain. It was nominated for the Scotiabank Giller Prize, and we're so thrilled that she could join us. Please say hello to Zalika Reed Benta, everyone. <laughs> Zalika, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thanks for inviting me. It's nice to see you again. We saw each other, I think, in September or something like that. Yeah. At a, like a literary festival. Yes. That was fun. It was fun. Now, do you like literary festivals generally as a person who writes the literature? Yeah, I mean, it's my first book. It's like... So I've only been to about three literary festivals, but they're all very different. They're all pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I get to see like it always feels like a high school reunion, just because you get to see like other authors that you like known from other places, and just like oh hey what's up, and you get to catch up. So that's pretty cool. I think some people has anyone here never been to a literary festival? Because I think some people think they're like dry affairs, you know. Not all the time. They're not. I think <laughs> no. they're really fun. I enjoy them very much. Yeah. And I enjoyed your book very much too. And I want to talk about it in a moment. But first of all, for context. Where are you from exactly? Are you from Toronto? I am from Toronto. Um, I grew up sort of all around Toronto, except my family and I never went east for some reason, but like uh, started like downtown, kind of like Young and Charles area. Then went to uh, Little Jamaica or Eglinton, West Marley, which is where the majority of that collection takes place. Kind of went to Wilson and Bathurst, kind of went to Brampton, then went to Maple, so kind of all over. So you're really a Toronto person. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Have you ever thought about living elsewhere? Uh, I did live in New York for two years uh, for because I did school there, and then I lived in England for six months. Did you like Toronto better than those places? I liked Toronto better than where I was in England, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> where were you in England? I was in this really small town called Bitterford um, in North Devon, where I was like one out of like a hundred people of color. So people just looked at me like, why are you here? Yeah, uh, right. Yeah, we, so. Do we? Do you think we take our, you know, I think it gets mocked maybe, or maybe, uh, maybe some people think it's maybe given more credence than it actually deserves. Do you think we undervalue or take our multiculturalism in Toronto for granted a little bit? I, don't, I have like a really complicated relationship with the whole idea of like multicultural Toronto. Like we do have a multicultural city and I do think that's something that I, um, I did. I didn't quite realize until I went to a place like Bitterford that also doesn't suggest we don't have, you know, systemic racism and yeah. and things like that. So I don't want it to just be like Toronto is like the greatest place in the world because of there's there's definitely issues here. But um, yeah, I mean, it was it was definitely um, a culture shock to go to a very small town where 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 people didn't I didn't see like anyone who looked like me. So yeah. I was I, I live in a small town and I was at a funeral the other day and I noticed I was the only person of color there. That's a weird thing to think at a funeral. I I decided afterwards. Why was I thinking about that? <laughs> I'm an idiot, <laughs> is what I was getting at there. <laughs> but it is weird. You start to notice it when you're in places yeah. like like Ripper. Let's talk about this book, Frank Plantain. As I mentioned, it was nominated for the uh, Giller Prize. So this is your first book. Yes. Uh, the, the Giller Prize is perhaps Canada's most prestigious literary award. 
Sure. Fair to say. <laughs> yeah. How did you feel about being nominated? First of all, you must have been sort of surprised. I was very surprised. I was also in the middle of having vertigo at the time. So um, it was a really strange morning. Um, I was sleeping and like I was trying to find a, a, like a, a position where it didn't feel like I was spinning. And then my agent called me and was just like, yeah, you were long listed for the Giller. And I didn't know what was happening. And I thought I was like hallucinating or something. And then she was like, no, like you were. I was like, holy shit, that's amazing. Yeah, um, yeah. So then like the excitement came and then I promptly threw up. So it was just, it was a really weird day. That is a strange time. Was, <laughs> do you think the vertigo was prompted by the anticipation of the announcement? I don't know how vertigo works. I've seen the film. How does vertigo work exactly? I don't, I still don't know. Like I, um, <laughs> I just because I was uh, I was in Vermont and I landed and usually I get sick after oh, I get to do flying, a flight. Yeah, right. But uh, I didn't get sick. Instead, I got vertigo. I didn't know what was happening for the first. Had you had it before? I've never had it before. Oh. So I didn't know what was happening for the first couple of days, and then I went to the uh, I went to a walk-in clinic and projectile vomited everywhere. So then he was like, "Go to the emergency room, please." And then I went to the emergency room, and they were like, "Just take gravel." The gravel didn't work, and then. It all ends with me going um, to a physiotherapist to do like a maneuver. And this is a very long story that has nothing no, to no, do with it. No, no, it had everything. It had vertigo and projectile vomiting and then a physiotherapist. You can't go wrong when you there throw you one go. of those you into your story. I thought it was good. Are you okay now? I'm okay now. It's, okay. Been, it's been gone okay. for a while. Tell us uh, more about this book. I've read this book. I enjoyed this book very much. Can you kind of offer a synopsis of the book for those who haven't read it yet? By the way. It looks like that. It's it called does. Frying Plant. It's available everywhere. Yes. Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's fantastic. And uh, please, can you characterize it for us? Sure. It's um, 12 linked short stories, although a lot of people think it's a novel. There was this great review where this guy was like, wow, it's like short stories. And I was like, yeah, it, it is. Um, and it follows uh, one character named Kara Davis from when she's about n when she's nine to about when she's 21. Um, and it's, you know, coming of age sort of stuff. And um, yeah, family and, and like, you know, bullying and, and all that kind of stuff. And it takes place in Toronto. It became a very Toronto-centric uh, collection. And yeah, that's now, why would the reviewer think it might be a novel and not a short story collection? I think it's because it follows the same characters. That's generally what I hear when people are confused, because I have people come up to me being like, so this didn't read like a novel, like it was like short stories. I was like, because they were short stories. But they're um, interconnected but short stories. But they're interconnected, stories. like, and it's chronological order, but... Um, it's a lot like a novel. It is a lot like a novel, except it's not a novel because like novels have linkages and stuff like that. Whereas with a short story, like if I end it when she's 10 and I jump to when she's 15, I don't have to explain what's happening between 10 and 15 because it's a new story. Right, it's not right. a novel. So that was generally why I didn't do it. I was just super lazy where I was like, I don't, I just want to go to this part of her life. I don't really want to explain what happened between those ages. But it does have this amazing flow where I do feel like I'm following this person's life. Well, that's but, great. But it's... <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad. And, and, that, and that the stories are definitely connected. I mean, we've, yeah. we've said that, and, and they, they speak to one another. Yeah. Okay. Is there a reason why... You, oh, I think we talked about this before, but I want to ask again, because it's fun. Is there a reason you chose short stories as a way to tell this particular character's story as opposed to a novel? Well, at first... You said laziness, but that can't be the only reason. Well, actually, at first, I thought I was writing a novel. I wrote uh, my first story, and I was like, yeah, this is the first chapter. And my mentor was like, that's not a chapter, it's a story. And I was like, oh, okay. So then I wrote a second what thing. Is it? Well, I don't, what's the distinction? Is it because it didn't say, like, one <laughs> at the top of the page? No, I think or it's because... Or two? There's it, uh, different numbers. <laughs> Because it, with, the st with the story, I think it goes through an arc, like the, there's a beginning, middle, and end. Which, right, of course. And so with a chapter, there's, a, there's sort of like a cliffhanger or at least something that makes the reader want to go on to the next chapter that picks up That's from. That's true, So sure. whereas with this one, they were just like self-contained stories. I found it completely compelling. Thank and you. Like I wanted to, I felt like I was learning about the characters as it was going. What is the significance of the title Frying Plantain? Okay, so there's like two different sort of like responses to that. One is that when I was workshopping this, a lot of people, it was only 90 pages at the time, and a lot of people were just kind of like, so this is really heavy and it's really tense and every time there's only, every time there's a moment of levity, it's always around food. I didn't know that. 
Um, I was also taking a food writing course at the same time. Uh -huh. And uh, we had to do like an ode to our favorite food and my favorite food just happened to be plantain. So I did like this 500 page ode to plantain. And I put it in my collection as its own sort of flash fiction piece. And I was like, what I'm going to do is that between every like long piece of story, I'm going to do a short fiction piece. And it's going to be like light and happy so people can get off my back about how depressing it is. <laughs> and um, but that didn't quite work out because flash fiction pieces are very difficult. It's 500 words and I, I wasn't really getting it. So then I ended up incorporating those flash pieces into my longer work. And then the story that becomes uh, Frying Plantain, that's where I put the ode to Plantain in it. And then I realized once I had um, incorporated it to the longer story, it spoke to other themes. It spoke to things like, you know, uh, cultural inheritance. It spoke to, because like she watches her grandmother like peel the plantain and fry the plantain, and she realizes that she can't really emulate that because she's not from Jamaica herself. Um, and then it becomes about forgiveness and healing and all of these different things just came became tied up I in see. that and but that's how come okay. I did that. Okay. Yeah. Did you have a I did I had a question about the structure, uh, the the short stories. Have you had anyone tell you that they read it out of order? Like in No. And ha have you considered what the experience would be reading it out of order or or because it's chronological Ooh. it just kind of naturally That's an interesting would question. Flow that well. Um well, I think it would be kind of cool to read out of order because I didn't write it in order. Like I wrote my, the last story first, I wrote the fourth story second. So um, I think it just ended up being chronological because that's what people thought would be more um, palatable to like you know readers. But I think I think if you started from the fifth story and you're working your way to the fourth story, I think you'd end up getting the same sort of feel that you get huh. chronologically. I just think that um, I think you just you know, you get introduced to Karen at a different point in her life. So it might kind of be like, oh, this is how she starts, and oh, that's why, and like, this is why, so. So when you reissue this book and have it remastered and remixed, <laughs> you can just, you know, fuck up all the story, yeah, like the chronology, sure. and then people will be like, whoa, this <laughs> blew my mind. That's yeah, pretty amazing. I think that could happen. Well, it's a remarkable book. What's kind of, so, you know, great success right off the start, which is Thank amazing. You. Uh, what's sort of next for you? Are you working on another yeah. collection of chapters or stories? <laughs> I am working on a young adult novel, a fantasy novel, which is totally different from this. Right now it's like 282 pages of mess, and I like gave it to two writers to be like, can you please tell me what I'm doing so like I can like finish it? Because I, I like to do that. So that's basically what that's happening. nice. That's a nice that kind of, uh, you know, that goes back to our literary festival discussion about the camaraderie among yeah. authors do you, you have are you a mentor at this point no i don't think i'm ready to be one i've only had one book and i still don't know what the hell i'm doing <laughs> it's just i would i feel very bad for someone who had me as their mentor let me let me just say this you seem to me like mentor material <laughs> you would be a good mentor if i might say how about it where's the applause <laughs> sign for that that was Thank you. i was just fishing for that no but it's true i i haven't i we've had a couple of interactions and i i have a nice warmth feeling like Aww. warm feelings here so i might hit you up for some advice frankly <laughs> okay. i need it uh where can people go to learn more about your book and you okay oh uh so i have a website zlikareadbenta.com i'm also on ig zlika rb twitter but i'm really, really yeah you twitter. have an odd twitter handle yeah okay i don't <laughs> I was, I was looking for it the other day. I'm like, this yeah. can't be right. But it, it, I was like a very pretentious undergrad when I came up with that handle. So it's literati 167. Don't judge me. What does um, the 167 mean? It was just because literati was taken and I felt like 167 just went with it. So I was like, yeah, that literati is, that 167. Is, that is pretentious. It was very pretentious. Well, I was in like my first year. You, you figured you'd be the 167th literati. <laughs> that's that's good. Okay, so people can follow. But you don't do much on I that. don't really do much on Twitter. I don't really like You know, a lot media. of writers love Twitter because it's the, the writing. Yeah, but like it's... <laughs> It's like so compact and then you end up getting into conversation. I prefer Instagram because I post something and leave it. I'm just like, okay, people can like it or people can Don't not. you hate all of it though? I kind of am sick of all <laughs> of it now. It doesn't make me feel good. It's all the emotionally manipulated, you know, kind of crap. <laughs> anyway, Tell follow us how you Zalika really feel. on social media <laughs> and uh, we have to take a quick break uh, and then uh, uh, James Hartnett and Michael Balazzo are on next. Uh, but how about a nice big warm round of applause for Zalika Reed Benta. Thank you. We'll be back. Hey, all 
we're back on uh, we're back on Long Night. Thanks for being here at the season premiere of Long Night at Long Winter 8.1 at the Transact Club. Who's having a good time so far? It's nice to have you all here. Thank you so much. And how about another round of applause for Zalika, our first guest? She was great. Our next guest hosts the uh, Landlord and Tenant Pod Mess, and I'm a big fan of both of them. They're uh, local comedians, and I, I just I, I can't say enough about them. Uh, please say hello to Michael Blazzo and James Hartnett, everyone. Hello. Thanks, everybody. Nice to have you back. Great to be here. The last time we had a thing like this was on the Transac stage. Yeah. Are we the first uh, two timers on this show? You seem like two timers to me. What do you? I, I, I don't do have affairs. <laughs> On my girlfriend. <laughs> Whereas I am strictly <laughs> monogamous. <laughs> uh, no, we, we have repeat guests from time to time, but you, you it's rare to have two people back who were on uh. together before, so it's nice to have you, and <laughs> it's always I like seeing you guys. Have you met James? We met briefly before the show. Hello, James. We so didn't meet before the show. James, uh, this is James. Is this <laughs> going to be awkward? That is this Vish wants to keep the Jameses away yeah, from each other. Yeah, yeah. So. It's, like, it's like you in the future. I say that with love. I don't know who that offends, yeah. frankly, but that's, that's true. It does feel like some kind of mirror thing happening oh. there. Anyway, yeah. it's nice to have you guys here. Uh, <laughs> I want to begin by uh, asking you about uh, one of the recent episodes of your show, which I enjoy. Thanks. Uh, you were at the Santa Claus Parade. James, what was going on there? Well, uh, on the show, it was the, we went to the Santa Claus Parade. I know, I just said Okay, that. well, it's, uh, you know. And uh, we went too early, so uh, we were just sitting there. I mean, this we didn't really do this. It was like a, a, a joke. Some kind of production yeah, we had involved? Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah, so okay. we... we um, a ruse. It was yeah. a ruse, right. and we went too early to the Santa Claus Parade, and uh, no one was there until finally we did see a float, but it turned out just to be a really unpleasant, aggressive uh, Wexit float. Oh, yeah. of a bunch of big I guys in balaclavas. And they had a, uh, a sort of Trudeau puppet in a noose. Yeah. So it ended up being a bad time. That's what the Yellow Vest Canada do. Wake up. They mm -hmm. wake up and do that. That's true. They, I, I just said they wake up, but it's true. That's what they... That is what they do. Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, we should tell people who don't know about your show. Uh, Michael, what is the landlord and tenant <laughs> pod mess? Well, it's a premise that I think, I, if not to speak for both of us, <laughs> it's a premise that I think we both regret at this point. <laughs> um, we, we started this comedy podcast and we didn't want to do something where just people came on and talked about how their careers had gone. Um, and we want to have some fun. Trajectory, so. yes. like a biographical. You yeah, know, like that failed podcast, uh, WTF. Yes, you know? yeah. <laughs> no why would anyone? That. <laughs> that's right. Why would anyone follow that? Uh, yeah, yeah. So we decided to have a bit of a premise to ours where uh, it's every episode's recorded in my studio apartment, and I am a uh, struggling uh, tenant living in James's building. That's the premise of the show. That's yeah. the premise of the and show. I'm a landlord. So yeah. each episode, Mike and I have a little sort of storyline going. And then we have usually a comedian on, or you. You've been on it. <laughs> or and a then musician. We just talk. We've had some musicians. Robin Hatch. Uh, yes. Oh, yeah. Robin's great. Teen Ravine. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, Justin Timberlake. <laughs> yeah. No. no. That's, yeah, that's he's, he's been on. Now, what was the, this? Is a, clearly a show a little bit about power dynamics. Is that fair to say? Yes, we're always a little bit at each other's throats on the show. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Our characters on the yeah. show hate each other. Mike says he wants me to die. Often, yeah. Now, why is that? Why do you want that James to die, Mike? It's just part. It's it's like uh, the odd, it's classic odd couple. It's an odd stuff. couple so, yeah, show. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's just yeah. a character I play. I don't but wish I, you to die. Oh, thank you. That's life. nice. Yeah. It's nice that we can have a hand for that. There's yeah. some healing going on. I think that's yeah. good. Thank, thank you. you. Half-hearted applause at best. No one really is worried about you two, but I am. <laughs> I listen to your show and I worry about your dynamic all the time. Mm. Now, uh, thank you. So, so, so how did you two meet the real use? Mm. How did you two meet, per se? Do you remember, James? Let's go to you. Oh, wow. Oh, yes. The first time I saw Mike, I was at Frosh Week at U of T. Uh-huh. And I... Oh, U of T, okay. <laughs> Shout out. Anyone here go to post-secondary education? <laughs> and we, uh, in my Frosh Week, I saw a funny band. What do you call it? A funny band. Joke and, band. Uh, and Mike was in a funny band <laughs> at my Frosh Week. They were so funny. They were called the Gentleman Callers. And Mike was in this funny band with his brother and another guy. Don't know what happened to him. 
<laughs> and then um, we met just doing comedy, and uh, but that's the first time I saw you, so Mike. Very that, funny. Does that check out with you, Mike? It does check out, although it does make me sound like I am like twice your age, <laughs> but I'm only a few years older. You yes. were also an undergrad at the time. No. Oh. I was <laughs> part of the uh, hired <laughs> professional entertainment. Are you significantly older than James? No, no only okay. a few. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. All right. It depends if you think a few a is significant. Yeah. I mean, yeah. What, yeah. How did you get into doing comedy? You were in school. Like, yeah. you, were you doing comedy during school? Yeah. I did like U of T stuff and got an agent. And then uh, I went You got an agent as a student? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, to do like Tim Horton commercial auditions, it wasn't a Does huge that mean deal. you're a child star? Yeah. Were you a child star? Yeah, kind of. You were a child yeah. star. I yeah. did not know that. Yeah. Okay. 20s. You're still a kid. <laughs> and, and <laughs> Mike, what about you? How did you uh, enter comedy, so to speak? Um, Through that joke band that uh, James mentioned earlier. Yeah. You are a musician on some. Oh, he's good. Not, not like these guys. Let's hear it for the band. Let's hear it for the bicycles, everyone. He's yeah. deflecting. Yeah. Mike, um, you know what Mike's amazing at? Harmony. Give him a note. He can do the harmony. I'm the Brian Wilson of the Toronto indie comedy scene. Is that right? You you can hit some notes. We have Owen Pallet on later. He might be interested. Oh shit! I'm busted. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's very talented, you know. Yes. James mentioned he's Oscar nominated. Like that's oh, that's wow. not that's not oh. easy to do. I don't yeah, think. Yeah, we're not. No, we we haven't even been nominated for a Canadian podcasting <laughs> award. <laughs> now you are you are a little you are a little down on your own show. That is something I've noticed. You're a little hard on yourselves. What are you expecting from the world with your podcast exactly, Mike? Is it James, would you agree? I feel like it's mostly Mike. <sighs> well, you know, Mike, Mike, it's in his nature to, to say, oh, you know, it's no big deal. He's humble. Because I'm, well, I have Eastern European heritage, so it's very, uh, a very pessimistic, uh, pessimistic outlook on life. But yeah. like yeah. this Canadian podcasting award thing that you bring up is a complete farce, isn't it? <laughs> Um, like it does. Those it's are your words. <laughs> I've, I, I've never been nominated. I've been doing a show for a while. Now, for those awards, though, you have to like submit yourself and pay. Yeah, <laughs> to that's a scam. It's a racket. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a total racket. So why do we care about this stuff? Are you you're gonna keep doing the show? I'm gonna keep doing this show. We're gonna keep doing it as long as um, our Patreon keeps just paying for the production of it. <laughs> the minute we have to pay out of our own pockets, I'm throwing the microphones into Lake Ontario. Right, yeah. right. No, no, but it's a great show. I think people should check thank it you, out. Thank it you. deserves a bigger audience, but thank there's you. it's a little bit hard to do comedy in Canada, isn't you? Is it? Is it is oh, no, V. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Mike Myers is from here. He's oh, done well. Dan Aykroyd. Uh, the list yeah. goes on and Leslie on. Yeah, yeah. 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 So I don't understand why everyone's having such a tough time doing comedy. James, you do comedy. Aren't you rolling I, I in it? I don't. That is a lie. <laughs> you don't do comedy? No. Oh, you quit, didn't you? I did, yeah. Yeah, that's have, not good. Have you ever reached out to Ackroyd to either do this show or your uh, private podcast? Uh, my private podcast? What does that mean? <laughs> what does that mean? The one that, mean? that you have on the dark net. No, uh, no, I don't know no. that. The I met Dan Ackroyd once. Ooh. In my life. Keep going. Do you want to hear the story? You have a fixation on Dan Aykroyd. You think he's we a like to poke fun. strange figure in yeah. comedy. But he's a kind of a... Did you like the movie Spies Like Us? I. That was one of the first movies I saw as a child. Me too. And it was, the theme song was by Paul McCartney. That's right. Yes. Yeah, the good, are you doing a trivia night? What's, what's going on? Who's now known as Grand Dude. Anyway. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, I met Dan Aykroyd at the last Tragically Hip show in Kingston. He was oh. in my, sitting in my <laughs> section, and I went to, I was like, guys, I should go say hi to Dan Aykroyd. I really <laughs> like Spies Like Us. So he was I'm sure that's how most people approach him. They're like, you're the guy from Spies Like Us. So he's sitting with his wife, who is uh, also in the movie Spies Like Us. No. So I walk over and I say, hey, Mr. Aykroyd, I'm a big fan. Uh, v, she's like, oh, Vish, how's it going? Great, uh, blah, blah, blah. And I say, uh, yeah, it's nice to see you. And I, you're lovely, too. I say to his wife, and I say, Is it, do you think we could get a photo? He's like, no, 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 I'm not here. I'm not here. <laughs> if they find out I'm here, they're going to drag me out of here, Vish. you got to get out of here. So I left. Wow. What does that mean? He's Dan Aykroyd. He might have been drunk or something. Did I don't he try know. to give you a Caesar? Did he try to give me a Caesar? Yeah. What is that? Is well, that he a had a very popular campaign of National Caesar Day. With no. Mox Clamato. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes, I yeah. vaguely recall He was recall very this. honestly unappetizing. Telling, having Dan Aykroyd tell you to drink a but Caesar this, for yeah. some reason. This Audience never accept a drink from Dan Aykroyd. No, it doesn't seem like it. 
that's men and women. Good, that doesn't make a call. <laughs> Who was going to take him away? I don't know. I think he was just trying to get rid of me. Like he didn't want to draw attention to himself. The band or security? Well, he was in us. We were all in like a pretty close section. I think he just didn't want to draw attention to him. Did himself. he have a beef with Gordon Downey? No, 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 <laughs> nothing like that. No, I think they were quite good friends. You know, he got them on Saturday Night Live. I remember that. In I remember that too. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, right. please welcome the best band from Canada, the Tragically Hip. You really <laughs> dislike him, don't you? No, I love. Like, I don't think you like Dan Aykroyd. He's very talented. You know, he's you know, <laughs> he's a big fan of uh, the blues. He loves Mississippi Delta blues. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> the most authentic kind, Michael. I think you're wrong to make fun of him. Now, you both are comedians who I love very much. James, Thanks. you put out a record, what, was it last year? Yes. What was it called? It's called or? Get Bent. Get Bent. A stand-up album. It's on iTunes. Please check it out. You know, iTunes I don't think exists anymore. I oh, think they got well, rid of it. Oh, I don't know. Right? Yeah, it's, it's on uh, some phone. Apple Music. Google. Apple Music, Apple I think, music. is what Apple it's Music. On. Yeah. Oh, thanks. It's yeah. a wonderfully funny album. Thank you. How many albums have you put out? That's the one. Uh, you're so I'm working do? on a number two. Are you working on it now? Well, yeah. Trying to. How's that going? It's hard. I found after doing, you know, you said you um, build up so much to record like an hour or so. Yeah. And then it's really hard to think of like news. I don't know. You feel like you left it all out there. It's hard to come up with new it's material. It's hard to do work. Yeah. <laughs> It's really hard. It's hard to do work. But mm. how many years uh, of material was that, would you say? Oh, God. I mean, most of it was a couple, but some, I mean, it was the first one I did, yeah. so some of it was awfully old. But it was, encur <laughs> it was encouraging. Like, you want to keep doing it. You don't oh, want to yeah. You don't be like James here and quit mm -hmm. comedy, do you, James? No, I am your future, in fact. <laughs> 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 now, Michael, big exciting news. You have a comedy album taping. I have a taping. It's exciting news, yeah. On, I'm going to uh, cheer for you. The guy's going to make a comedy album. Thank you. Well, what's the details there? What's uh, going on? I'm recording it very soon, uh, December 3rd and 4th at the Ossington, uh, right here in Toronto. Uh, two nights, different lineups, and uh, James is doing one of the nights. Mm hmm and uh, I'm looking forward to it. Please come, everybody. It's pay what you can. And, uh, is this your? Why did you stress that at the end? <laughs> <laughs> Mike is nagging himself and us. Yeah. Mike, even if you charge ten bucks, you people can charge would come. whatever you want. I would mean, hear, who here would pay to see any comedy? <laughs> All right, Mike, Greg, you're Greg. Oh, you're cucking <laughs> us. <laughs> They, they paid to get into this. I mean, oh, this, this is technically comedy. Anyway, yes, uh, is they, this your first album? It is my first album, yes. Yeah, okay. And so how many years of material are we talking about? Um, so I've done stand-up for a long time on and off. So it's some jokes I'm doing are almost 10 years old, and some are just uh, very recent. I'm just trying to collect the best of my material. Ten years old. So is yeah. it is it dated? Are we going to hear like jokes about Joey Buttafuoco? Joey Buttafuoco, uh, uh, a lot of uh, Y2K material. Y2K material, yeah. yeah. I think we've gone way past ten years, by the way, but yeah. no, I've lost track of time. <laughs> but yeah, so no, it's, it's, it must be exciting. It is exciting. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Um, it's going to be great, and uh, you'll you'll be hearing a lot more from me in the future. I I think <laughs> so. I think that's fair to say. Okay, now where can people go to learn uh, more about your podcast and maybe you individually, James? Why don't you start? Uh, well, I'm on Twitter at James Hartnett. The Very funny on the Twitter. Thank you so I much. I think you're I think you're amusing. Thank you. Yeah. And um, the podcast is very fun, funny. We have a lot of local comedians who are great. And Vish, too, sometimes. Why do you keep... <laughs> well, I'm just... Saying you know. that some people are funny and also Vish oh, every time. Oh, God. What did I do on the show again? We, you had me on to talk we about... We had a tech problem where yeah. I was sweating quite hard because oh, yeah, I couldn't figure out how to... Oh, yeah, you were pretty frazzled. I had yeah. come all the way from Guelph, right? <laughs> no, we're having you for round two. No tech problems. <laughs> okay. And you did some sort of uh, freestyle rap. I, I really enjoyed... No, I actually highly criticized your theme song, which you wrote. Yes. Can we? Can you do an acapella version of it right now? <laughs> right. Uh, it's, just, it's just the words "landlord" <laughs> no, and "tenant" repeated twice. Say. No, but you wrote harmony. this very synth-oriented uh, uh, theme yeah. song that I enjoyed, but I, I pretended I didn't. Yes. And then I wrote a freestyle rap about you guys, and yeah, uh, yeah it was a good time. It was good. It was fun. That was. Uh, is that the best episode of the show? It is our most downloaded episode of all time. Yeah. <laughs> it cannot be true, but that's. It's got to be up there, right? I mean, it is. Yes. I'm it is. almost almost a nominee for the Canadian Podcasting Awards. I yeah. think. Aren't we all? All really, I think everyone here should be. should be. Yeah. 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 Anyway, yeah. sorry. Uh, 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 the show is great, and, and you're on you. Twitter. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And Landlord and Tenant Podmas. Landlord and Tenant Podmas. It's wonderful. And 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 Mike, what about you? Where oh, I'm on. <laughs> I'm also on Twitter at mbalazzo, and uh, we're on Apple Podcasts and Google Play. 
under the name of the show. Oh, and yes. it's a great show. You should keep doing it. Thank you. We will. Thank you. I, yes. I appreciate that. All right. How about a hand for uh, Mike and James? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We're going to take a quick break, and then Owen Pallet will be out here. Stick around. Thank you very much. a cheer for the best goddamn band in the land, the Bicycles. Busting out the landlord and tenant pod mess theme song. Thank you so much. I really do love you guys. I want you to know that. No matter what happens to me and to you, I think you're great. How about another hand for James and Mike of the landlord and tenant pod mess? All right, our next guest is an Oscar-nominated uh, artist and uh, one of our, our greatest artists to ever come out of this particular city, if I might say. Please make some noise for Owen Pallet. Hi, Bish. Hello. Nice to see you. Is it? What is that supposed to mean? Of course it is. Why would you make things awkward right away? Because it's me? Because you know that's what I'm going to do? Why would you do that to me? I was just I was just asking for confirmation. Do you know that every time I've driven to Toronto lately, I end up some, some except for today, but I end up kind of driving through Parkdale because that's what the map tells me, and I always see you walking around. I'm I have a dog, so I'm often walking oh, around pa Parkdale go. with the dog. Well, not my dog anymore. Uh, I lost the dog in the breakup. Oh, I'm sorry. But I'm still walking her. <laughs> Wait a minute! You lost the dog, but you have the responsibility of the dog. Is that what you're saying? Uh, yeah. It's not something where you're just going through the muscle memory of walking a dog, but there's nothing there? No, it's like one of those things. Uh, my therapist was explaining it to me. It's like because I still want to kind of connect to him in the relationship, so I show up at his house a lot under the auspices of wanting to walk the dog. Oh, man. Breaking up is so hard to do. Actually, it's great. It's going great. It's going well? <laughs> yeah, it's nice. awesome. It's a okay. great breakup. Oh, and I mentioned in my brief intro that you, I think of you as a, you know, a real important figure from Toronto, but where are you actually from? Are you from here? Uh, I was born in Mississauga. Oh, so nearby. Mm -hmm. And what was that like for you? To, uh, were you did you grow up there? Um, I lived there for a while, but uh, my parents were split up and their divorce was pretty acrimonious, so I was kind of bouncing around. Oh, I see. Was there a dog involved? Nope. Okay, good. Let's move on. I <laughs> tried to make it fun and it didn't work out at all. No, uh, okay, so were you mostly in Mississauga? You know what's great about Mississauga? Indian restaurants. My I'd first exposure to Indian food was actually in Mississauga. Okay. And uh, I don't recall this event. I was probably three years old, but uh, we went to this Indian restaurant because my parents really liked Indian food, and they told me, I'm sure we'll find things that you can eat, and they asked the people to make the food quite not spicy for right. my three-year-old tongue. And uh, every dish that came out, I was not able to eat it. Um, I would just I could put, would put it in my mouth and would react with pain, and uh, but then they had rice pudding for dessert. Kier, yeah. it's called kier. It's called kier. I don't want to school you in your story about Indian food, but it's called kier. Okay. Can any are there any Indians here? What am I talking about? There probably aren't. Uh, anybody white? Uh, nice to see you. I'm just kidding. Sorry. Talk about your rice pudding. Story. It's okay. So it's called kier. Yeah, it is. I've heard that. Uh, uh, everywhere in India, it's called kier. I have I can't ver I've been to India but not everywhere. I can't verify. People probably call it all sorts of weird fucking things. But yeah, I call it kheer. My mom calls it kheer. Okay. Yeah. I, I will call it kheer. Little from like now the on. slivers of almonds maybe. Uh, I was 3, I don't remember. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Continue. So I ate it and um all the way home I was talking about how it was my favorite restaurant. Oh. Yeah, because all I ate was kheer. Do you remember yeah. the restaurant? Uh, no. Is it still there? Uh, no, it's gone. Okay. Do you yeah. get back to Mississauga much? Mm, yeah, I have aunts and uncles that live there. I sometimes go and visit them in their McMansion, and uh, you know, it's pretty. It's it's what it is. Nice, yeah. nice. Mm -hmm. So, how did you end up in Toronto? I don't actually. We've talked thousands of times in this mm -hmm. sort of context interviews, but I don't remember how you got to Toronto. How did you get to Toronto? Not, uh, not literally the uh, bus, car. I mean, 
Why are you in Toronto now? I went to U of T. Oh, I you went to U of T. Yeah, I enrolled at the you, University of Toronto. Did you happen to see the Gentleman Callers performing by any chance? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Mike's band? You did? Yeah. How were they? It was terrific. Nice. <laughs> that's great. That's no, there was, great. A lot of, there was a lot of bands coming out of UT. Like, that's where Steve Cato and I met. Was oh, at, okay. At UT. From the Blocks yeah. Recording Club? Yeah, we met actually when I was 20 and he was 19. I met Leon Tani on the same day when he was 16. 16? Yeah. He was only, oh, I didn't realize He was only that. 16 at the time. Yeah, he's, he's... But he's aged since then. No, he's still 16. He's still 16. Yeah. Now, this room, we're in the Transac, which I consider to be very significant to Toronto's independent arts community. Uh, does this particular place have any significance for you? Uh, do you have? A, I know you have a history here of some sort. Um, yeah, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind was I remember seeing an AIDS Wolf show here before AIDS Wolf got good because they really got good at the end. Like it was the best live performance I've ever seen. Was like the last three AIDS, AIDS Wolf shows I saw. But this was before then when they were still really bad. Where were they from? Where are they from? They're from Montreal. They're from Montreal, yeah. right? So Chloe was singing and she decided she would put her entire mouth over the microphone and just go, oh, except like really loud. Uh-huh. And I was standing over there next to the speaker and it was so loud I saw the speaker glow. It just suddenly started glowing. I didn't know speakers could do that. And um, I think I lost some hearing. But that's the second time actually that I experienced physical pain at an AIDS Wolf concert. Uh, the first being late 2004 when I broke my ankle while they were playing. And uh, Chloe said as I uh, hobbled at the door, uh, let's play that song. Owens clearly really likes that song. So, yeah. This band sounds bad for your health. I don't, it seems like nothing good has come of Oh, I think AIDS about Wolf. them every day. I think they're a great band. Oh, okay, awesome. Yeah. So uh, you, you, you UT and then you started, you mentioned Steve Cato and, Lee and mm. the other, you, so you got kind of immersed in the arts community, that's fair to say. Yeah. And we, what was your role in Blocks exactly? It was a collective, right? Uh, I ran it. Yeah. You ran the whole thing? No. <laughs> <laughs> it was a collective, was it not? Um, kind of. It uh, incorporated as a uh, as a non-profit. Um, was it for-profit? No, it was non-profit. Did you make any money, Owen? Uh, I made lots of money. Yeah, you, yeah. D- you sold a lot of records for Blocks. I, I didn't think. make as much money as I should have. <laughs> Is this becoming a legal dispute? It's just supposed to be a friendly conversation. No, no, no. It wasn't that. I just, I just, I didn't. I set up a corporation, and so I was paying a lot of uh, personal so taxes. So, like, we we're talking about those days. Those are what we were talking about. What, fifteen years ago, something like that. Yeah, something like that. What, what do you think of that time now? We, I mentioned the uh, Oscars. You're nominated for an Oscar. You are you still in Arcade Fire? I was never in Arcade Fire. You kind of, you, you sort of are in Arcade Fire. <laughs> no, I'm let friends re- with Arcade Fire. Your Honor, let the record show. The witness is clearly a member of Arcade Fire. <laughs> no, you you have been a touring member of Arcade Fire. What do you call yourself? Do you call yourself Owen Pallet? I don't know where I'm going with this. <laughs> you are a member of Arcade Fire, you not? You kind of hang out with it's them. It's like this. Are you a member of CBC? No, I don't work there. I haven't worked there for like five or six years. But are you a member of CBC? No, I don't think so. Okay, I don't think I'm a member of Arcade Fire. Why would Fire? you bring that up? That's just like a place I used to work. This is very depressing. Well, you now. brought up Arcade Fire. You know, Fire. they fired me, right? They got rid of me. I don't want to. Did the Arcade Fire fire you? No, they never fired me. Okay, no. Yeah. So if they were to, <laughs> let's say Arcade Fire were to reconvene. <laughs> and go out on a tour or make a record. <laughs> Owen Pallet, are you involved in this process in any way? I don't know. And if I did know, I, I wouldn't... You I wouldn't tell me? No, I wouldn't. <laughs> Why I, not? We have all sorts of conversations. We talk about Kier. I know. <laughs> Look, I'm, I'm happy to disclose all manner of things about my personal life, but I prefer not to talk about my clients. Okay. Oh, clients. <laughs> yeah. So they're, you, you, they work for you. Okay, I get it now. <laughs> No, 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 no. If they're no, a client, I, I work for them. They, you right, got, okay, I'm sorry. Okay, power I, didn't, dynamic all I didn't understand what you were saying. What are you kind of up to these days? Because you just played a show. James uh, Keese, have you met James? Uh, yeah, I know James. James was just uh, saying he saw you perform in Toronto at, uh, where was the show? It was at the Longboat. Oh. Uh, right. Former site of this very talk show. Mm. Are you doing the applause sign for a building? That's where we did the show. Oh, for we used to do the space. show. We used to do long night at the Longboat Hall, and then we made them so successful, long winter, mm. they kicked us out. Oh, yeah. You can't... Transact. Hey, how about a big cheer for the Transact? <laughs> Why are we going down bad memory lane? No, it's we can't do it there anymore. So That's you just bad. played a show. What's the occasion? Do you have new music uh, written and recorded? Yeah, I got a record. It's been done for a couple of years, but uh, I, um, I don't know when I'm putting it out yet. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So are you playing the songs live? Yeah, I'm... Playing them, touring them, got shows here and there and stuff okay. like that. And putting together a new live show, well, I put it together. I'm just kind of like refining it at this point. Okay, okay. Mm-hmm. I assume somewhere down the line you and I can have a more thorough discussion 
but this new album, right? Sure, yeah, you this, want to come this over? This experience hasn't sullied our relationship in any way. No, I still see you as a, a valuable asset to uh, you know my car career trajectory. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> That's all I want. That's all I want to be. I'm glad you said it like that. <laughs> when you put it that way, it feels particularly <laughs> nice. You're doing something at the Art Gallery of Ontario? Yeah, um, there was a Peter Paul Rubens exhibition that's still ongoing. And uh, they asked me to uh, create some kind of a musical uh, accompaniment slash intervention something. So uh, I went to my friends at Clavier Baroque, who are uh, they're fantastic harpsichord makers. And they're based here in Toronto and have been um, kind of... Yeah, Dan and Don. Uh, yeah, Dan and Don, they're amazing. <laughs> And their their harpsichords are harpsichord heckle sort of yeah, that, that is was, rare that, that was is the a first time true Transac moment. <laughs> but yeah, so they uh, they brought in a couple of harpsichords um, because uh, you know at the time that Rubens was painting these paintings in Antwerp it was also the heyday of the harpsichord the Flemish harpsichord was being made uh, it was by a family just down the street from them and while he never owned one or painted one he often visited their uh, workshop and stuff like this. Oh, so I see. Um, so I, I wanted to have a sort of harpsichord installation, but also have the music that was being played to be somewhat of a, a you know, slice across the work that was being played. So I adapted some Julius Eastman works to be played uh, as this kind of like a, you know, drone, not only because I felt that the aesthetic of the work kind of complemented the paintings, but also the politics of the work kind of uh, contrasted. So uh, that's what I did. And we did a gala concert too with uh, a bunch of works for... Antiphonal Choir by Chris Dirksen and Matt Smith. They composed work uh, specifically for the event. And I wrote something, too. You seem smart. Oh. <laughs> you said a lot. You that said sounds like such an insult. No, no, you do. You, you seem it. like a smart guy. You used the word gala. I caught that. That was good. <laughs> uh, it's amazing how much stuff you Should can I do. Should I take over? No, it's fine. <laughs> I'm having a good time. <laughs> I'm enjoying myself. I don't know about you. No, it's that's that sounds great. What are the dates of that though? Is it uh, like I the mean? The gala has already transpired. Right. It happened about you a month ago. You said it again. Yeah. An unbelievable word. <laughs> really Am I saying it right? Away. You could say gala, but yeah, that's, that's a kind that's of an right. apple, no, I think. It's ga yeah, exactly. Yeah. Gala is. Um, go. It goes on, I believe, until pretty much till the end of the year. But you should go now. Okay, and uh, sorry, it's at it's at the AGO. Obviously. It's at the AGO. It's at the AGO. Okay, mm -hmm. and uh, what else is going on? Is that pretty much it? You're working on this record that may be out next year. I have questions. Oh, God. What is the... Sorry, I didn't mean that. That was rude. Yes? <laughs> yes, James? Well, uh, so the first was a two-part question. First, why has the, is the record done, and why isn't it out yet? Or, or why... What's, what's, what's the barrier to it being out? And the second part of that is, where do you live? I would like to come over and hear it. So if you could maybe play it for me, because uh, I'm, I'm keen to... We're getting I, into some sticky legal, I, I legal saw a lot of it at the show, around. obviously, yeah, yeah, yeah. and really enjoyed it. I'd like to, to listen to it more often. Well, despite my <laughs> gregarious <laughs> public persona, um, I am uh, going through a number of mental health issues, oh. and um, this has kind of kicked back the record several times. And as in addition to this, um, the label is trying to find like the right time to put it out because they like me acknowledge that it's a work of genius and it needs the proper <laughs> amount of a proper amount of uh, you know it needs to be released at the right time uh, that's the answer to your first question your second question is uh, I live in I, I'm actually displaced right now I don't have a place Fair. to live um, I'm staying in an Airbnb um, <laughs> close to my ex-boyfriend who I'm totally not stalking um, <laughs> And, uh, Is there a dog. police officer here? <laughs> <laughs> I'm nervous about many things at this moment. No, that's, uh, first of all, I didn't realize you were having struggles. I, I'm sorry to hear that. Are you feeling, you're doing, you seem good right now. You oh, I'm great these days. Would, yeah. it be, would it be helpful for you if you and I just got together and had chats? <laughs> Are you a therapist? More or less. <laughs> Do you have a good sense of boundaries? Absolutely. Do you respect my bodily autonomy? I can. Do you seek to harm me? <laughs> no, I don't believe so. Okay, then I think we can hang out. I think we should chat more, Owen. I'd like okay. to help you if I can, and <laughs> I need help too. So it's, I will say, it means a lot that you would agree to be on this show, uh, because it's not that good. And I, <laughs> I think it's lovely of you to make time for it. That's all I, I want to say. Now, if people want to learn more about Owen Pallett, 
uh, on the computers and the phones, where should they go? <laughs> I just have to interject. I've always thought you're like the funniest guy. Oh. Yeah. Honestly. You, you have like been I've, always, I've always wanted you to be the host for Polaris because every single time that you're doing the kind of like the uh, red carpet or anything, uh-huh. you're always making everyone so uncomfortable. <laughs> and I'm, I never stop laughing. That's it's what so most producers, great. that's what producers want in a host <laughs> of a major gala. I got to say the word too. <laughs> they want someone who makes everyone completely uncomfortable all the time. No, th- I think you just described my limited appeal very well. <laughs> Guy's wow. kind of a dick, but he's funny. Great. What you do we do with that? So funny. Oh, You're thanks, so funny. No, I appreciate it. No, I, uh, I, I, what was the question? Uh, where can people go to learn more about you on on the internet if you uh. want them to? You're at oh, are you got a locked Twitter account now? I think I noticed the other day. It's not locked. I just haven't updated it. Oh, okay. But it's yeah. O Palette. Is that right? No. There's no point in going there. You can okay, go to my uh, Instagram. Instagram. My, uh, I update my Instagram maybe <laughs> twice a year. <laughs> Could we follow each other on Instagram? That might be good for me. Okay, that would be, start that'd the be therapy. good for you. Yeah. Okay, yeah, okay, let's, let's follow so each other. It's He Posts Clouds. He Posts the Clouds. <coughs> there yeah. we go. Okay. Isn't that clever? I thought of that myself. <laughs> so smart. He's just so smart. How about a hand for Owen Pallet? We're going to be back with a bit of a panel. Stick around. Thank you very much. Owen Pallet, everybody! This episode of Creative Control is sponsored by two amazing places. Planet Bean Coffee in Guelph. Freshly roasted, fair trade, certified organic coffee. You can learn more about Planet Bean at planetbeancoffee.com. Do you like coffee? Yeah, I like coffee. Uh, coffee is really good. I'm a kid and I don't personally drink it, but once I taste it, I love it. Oh, and cappuccino ice cream. I love cappuccino ice cream. Mm. What about you? Do you like coffee? No. Why not? I don't, because well, I do don't like the smell of it. Okay, that seems fair. But what about this? Let me lay this on you. Granddad's Donuts, located at 574 James Street North in Hamilton, Ontario. The best donuts anywhere. You can learn more about them at granddads.ca. Hey, do you like donuts? Yes. What's your favorite donut? Uh, chocolate with sprinkles on top. That sounds pretty good. What about you? Do you like donuts? Uh, I like coffee and donuts. My favorite donut is probably Boston Cream. Amazing. Amazing. You can get one of those at Granddad's Donuts. Thank you very much to Granddad's Donuts and Planet Bean Coffee. Oh, the song Bad Luck by Royal City. That's a good song. Owen, were you a member of Royal City? Uh, no. I'm pretty sure you were. I played with them some. Yeah, I used to see you play with Royal City. I thought you were a member. No, I wasn't. And uh, that around that time, I think me and Bob were kind of floating members. Oh, yeah, Bob Wiseman. Yeah, yeah, but that was also at the time that the band kind of spectacularly imploded. So uh, yeah, We don't have to talk about that. Good yeah. friends of mine. I like Royal City. How about a hand for <laughs> the bicycles playing all my favorite songs tonight? Okay, as you can see, we have all our guests on stage. Nazalik, are you there? I can't see Owen. Come on. I am give me here, some yes. We got uh, <laughs> Mike and James and hey. James. I uh, neglected to explain uh, this portion of the program. We don't have a lot of time left, but what we normally do at this point of the show is we speak to the audience. I do most of the talking, and I say, I need a couple of topics of conversation, and whatever you want us to talk about, we will talk about. It's like a stupid game show, really, or a smart game show. So does anyone have anything they'd like us to talk about right now? Just shout it out. Anybody? Christmas. No, not Christmas. Too religious. (laughs) Anything else? Universal basic income is the topic. Well, J- uh, James and I are part of the Yang Gang, so we love it. I didn't realize you were part of the Yang Gang. I would have included that in my introduction. Absolutely, That's, yeah. yeah. What, uh, uh, Owen, do you have thoughts on universal basic income? I actually don't know what that is. What is universal basic Well, you're the uh, Yang Gang, can I tell have, us. I have it is like a Silicon Valley uh, sort of idea to create income equality where everyone would be given by the government like some basic sum a month, like a thousand dollars a month, a month. This is what Andrew Yang is proposing. Right. Andrew Yang is a candidate for the president of the United States currently or did he drop out? <laughs> no, he's still in. He's still in. Yeah. Okay, you would know you're members of the Yang gang. James, you were going to say something? Uh, if, if with the permission of the chair, uh, I would like to make a radical addition to the idea of a universal basic income. Sure. 
So a universal basic income is essentially like everybody, the idea is everybody deserves to make a, a living wage. Yeah. And that anybody who doesn't make that would get topped up to a living wage and it would come from people who make much more like more than that. Oh, that's like, good. You know, people like Owen who are, you know, <laughs> forming corporations and have clients. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, right. So, but my, so that's the idea. Yeah. My radical idea, and I recently proposed this to my uh, mother-in-law and it did not go well, was that my solution to the larger world's problems is that uh, at the age of 65, everyone gets a guaranteed annual income topped up by the government, and in return, they lose the right to vote. James, that's James. You're a genius. That is, a, you're you're smart. That's good. That's a great she idea. She lost her mind. Well, yeah, <laughs> doesn't seem appealing to her. Based really on her did not. Context is everything. I would say for ideas like that. So it does. It does sound like you're throwing money at a problem, really, though. Well, yes. Yeah. That's like well, we I could. We could just take it away without the universe. I I thought that was no, a nice trade-off. Should like we should no one wants you to the, die. You should have like a good life. You just don't get to make decisions about the future anymore. Like, it sounds to me that you're avoiding the rent to income inequality in this city and many others. That is the actual problem. But that's just my thought. Well, yes. No. She wasn't concerned about the income part. Oh, your your mother. That is my mother-in-law was uh, no. Was, she doesn't care. Reacted quite strongly to the idea that she was not going to be voting. Can James still come to your house after making that proposal? <laughs> yeah, everyone's welcome to my house. Welcome. That that would mean that no member of the cast of The Irishman could vote <laughs> in any election. Yeah, Mike, that is an interesting point. I hadn't thought of it from that angle, but that is a good one. Are there any other topics of conversation that you'd like us to cover? Perhaps the new Martin Scorsese film. The Irishman. The Irishman. Does anyone... No, we haven't seen The Irishman. Harpsichords. harpsichords is the suggestion. Uh, Zalika, this is clearly your domain. What do you know? Of course. Do you know what a harpsichord is? No. <laughs> oh, and can you school us on what a harpsichord is? I was going to ask that question, but I'm not a good journalist. Uh, what is a harpsichord exactly? It's a stringed keyboard instrument that's kind of a bit of a precursor to the piano. It features a number of jacks that are these long wooden uh, rectangular things that have little things on them called quills. You press a key, the quill plucks the string. Uh, you can hear the harpsichord in popular music on the left banks, I've Got Something on My Mind, and also uh, certain Tori Amos songs such as Cotylite Sneeze feature a harpsichord. Um, I love that your popular music reference was the left bank. <laughs> That's a famous song. I mean... Uh, Jens Lechman sang, sampled it for Black Cab, but then I don't think he could get the right, so he had to replace the harpsichord with mandolin. But didn't, didn't the Rolling Stones once use a harpsichord? They're big. I have never heard of that band. They're big. They're huge. And at one point, I believe, Mike, you like music. Uh, you were in the Gentleman Callers. Is it in Lady Jane or yes. something? Yes, it would be in that sort of yeah. era when they were... You know, yeah. blues music. Blues music, indeed. Dan Aykroyd would be a big fan of the harpsichord, right, Owen? Any other topics of conversation before we wrap up the show? What would you like to talk about? What do you, you guys in the back are talking. What do you want us to talk about? Lead in the water. Lead in the water? What is wrong with you people? This is very depressing. Okay, uh, Salika, do you want to talk about lead in the water? What are your thoughts on lead being in the water? Obviously, there should not be lead in the water. <laughs> Well, I'll take the counter argument. More lead. Let's get more lead in there. I did. Oh, screw you. I did think that Zalika really divided the crowd there, and I am surprised that she would make that pronouncement. Lead in the water is bad. Wasn't that a shocking report that most water in Canada that we drink from our taps has lead in it? Owen, did you hear about this? What's lead? Is that bad? It's bad. It's a bad substance. I, I don't know much more about it. Um, the Yang Gang might know. What's up with lead? It's like uh, it, soon Toronto will look and feel like Flint, Michigan, I guess. Yes, that's the, that, they're the, suffering the water a big crisis lead in problem. Flint. There's lead Maybe in the water Mike, that's bad. Michael Moore can make another movie about Yeah, us. it's bad. Yeah. No, it's a bad situation, as, as Alika said. So thank you for the topic. Um, uh, I think we're almost at, We have time for maybe one more. Cats is They're your They're fucking suggestion? awesome. <laughs> cats are cool. I like cats. I used to have a cat. He was my best friend. Oh, if you're talking about the musical, then no. No, we're talking about the animal or the musical? Is there a difference? Yes. 
Yes, there is. Is it? Well, I, I love, I'm a cat person primarily. I know and you like to walk a dog. Uh, you mentioned that. It's a bit of a strange circumstance that you have there with the dog walking. I say, like the scenario doesn't seem healthy, but still, cats are wonderful, don't you think, uh, James, Mike? You cat people? My girlfriend has two cats, and she recently moved in, so now I have two cats too. And they are nice, but one of our cats fear sprays out of his butt, I guess? And I hate it so much. He ca- jumped on the bed and just for no reason fear sprayed out of his butt all over the damn bed. I didn't know. Does anybody fear, else have a fear spraying cat? Fear spray? Is that is that the technical term for what? I don't know what. This, uh, some spray comes out of his butt. It's not <laughs> urine and it's not feces. So. Squirt so, is piss. Okay, that's. That's weird. I, I had a cat named Gary. He was the best. I taught him to sit on command. Owen, have you ever done that? Have you ever taught a cat to sit on command? No, I, I, but I don't know. I do, do, like, I do, do like cats, though. Cats are better than dogs, right? Well, I think cats are delicious, for sure. <laughs> Salika, do you like cats? I'm going to move on. Moving on. <laughs> yeah, I have a cat, and her name is Kitty. Yeah, I call, basically, I call my cat Cat, but I just call her Kitty. What? You're a writer. Couldn't you come up with a better name? <laughs> well, her name was technically June because we got her in June. How but many then names does this goddamn cat have? <laughs> a lot, it's apparently. It's amazing, yeah. Uh, but she only answers to Kitty. Isn't it weird that we have animals and we can just name them whatever we want and then change the name? That's great. That's great being a human. <laughs> All right, that's our show. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to hand for Owen Ballot. We have Zalika there. We have James. We have Mike. Thank you so much. This is James Keys. This is The Bicycles. This is Linda, the applause lady. Stay tuned for more Long Winter. We'll see you December 13th. Good night, everybody. Bye.